Good morning, church family. Today's scripture passage is from 1 Peter 2, 11. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, and as always, it will be on the screen as well. Uh, after we read the passage, or after I read the passage, as always, I'll uh, respond with, this is God's word, and as a congregation, we say, thanks be to God. Awesome. We're getting there. We're getting all liturgical. 1 Peter 2, 11. The Apostle Peter writes, dear friends... I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Have you noticed today that serving is kind of cool? Serving helps you out societally, right? Businesses boast about how many customers they've served. High schoolers put community service hours on their college applications. Most of the nonprofits in this city have a good reputation with serving. As primary and elections descend on our sorry souls, we're going to see lots of politicians serving on camera, especially in Iowa. Uh, All this to say serving can help your social life. It can increase your social status. And in this area, we couldn't be any more different from ancient Israel. Here in ancient Israel, get in your time machine, go back. Uh, Serving is not cool. Serving is not socially advantageous. The ancient Near East is an honor, shame society, very hierarchical, meaning there's layers, there's levels of people. And servants and slaves are at the very bottom layer. And... Uh, you would never serve down a, a layer or a level. That would, be, uh, that would be shameful, ruinous even. It could uh, ruin your reputation, especially if you serve down the social ladder. And it's in this context that one night, we read about it in John 13, a famous teacher, a famous rabbi, uh, takes off his coat and washes the filthy feet of his social inferiors. Jesus, he washes the feet of his students. It's a jaw-dropping incident, uh, extremely embarrassing, in some ways deeply disturbing. Never before in recorded history had a master stooped so low to wash the feet of uh, his students. To take the matter another step further, Jesus is more than just a master and teacher. The early Christians began to worship him as God. Paul tells us this in Philippians 2, 6, Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So the master, the teacher, this God, he does what? Well, Paul continues, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a slave, being made in human likeness. Most of our translations will say servant, but the Greek word doulos does mean slave. Translators often avoid it because that word slave notably has some strong 
uh, baggage attached to it. It's a very loaded word. But I think we should keep it. It gives us a greater sense, appreciation for Jesus. He doesn't just become a servant. He willingly becomes a slave, takes on the posture of a slave, serving and saving us. And then he dies his slave-like death, the unprecedented, brutal death of crucifixion. Tim Keller told this illustration a little while ago, and it stuck with me. Uh, Many of you have goals, dreams, desires, ambitions. Ask any middle school student what they want to do when they grow up, and what's the answer these days? They want to be a YouTuber. All of them want to be uh, rich and famous primarily through uh, YouTube. And, you know, many of us want to be rich and famous as well, or at least rich, right? Uh, Now, take that desire to another level. What if you have this strong goal, strong ambition, and you just say to yourself, you know, 2,000 years from now, I'd like to be the most influential person who's ever lived. Imagine if you had that goal, that dream, that desire, right? I would like a third of the world to worship me. A third to half of the world in 2,000 years. Uh, I would like many major civilizations to be completely built around my teachings. I'd like people to gather once a week and worship me. That would be a very ambitious goal, I suppose. Uh, You know, good luck. Uh, If that was your goal, what would your strategy be? Right? Uh, How would you get there? How would you do it? Would you do it the way Jesus did it? Not on your life. Born into poverty, lived in obscurity most of his life, becomes a teacher but takes the posture of slave and servant. No political or economic power, doesn't even write anything. No manifestos. He serves. He washes feet. He dies a slave's death. If I were running your PR firm and suggested that for your, uh, your ambitions... I think you'd fire me. You'd say, no way. And yet Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection sets this chain of events in place to which now he's the most famous person to ever live, the most influential person to ever live. And then Jesus passes the baton on to the early church, the first Christians. They take great inspiration from the posture of Jesus. And they notice, okay, if he's the master, if he's God, and he does this, What does that mean for us as his followers? And so that's what we read about in 1 Peter, the early church. He tells the new Jesus followers in verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So here's how to serve society. Here's how to serve our neighbors, says Peter. Uh, First, don't be surprised if you're accused of doing wrong. And he, he says, hopefully it's a wrong accusation. Uh, in verse 20, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? In other words, if you're a Christian jerk and you get persecuted for it, that's not persecution. That's, you're just a jerk. Uh, your fault. If you're constantly talking to coworkers and not doing the job you're paid to do, uh, that's on you. That's not real persecution. But sadly, in the early church, there were some extreme false accusations flying around. Christians were rumored to be cannibals. Did you know this? Because they ate this guy named Jesus in the body and the blood of Jesus. We're going to take communion today as well. They were called atheists uh, and anarchists for not worshiping the gods of the state. There were rumors about these Christians. They'd have these love feasts. And so that turned into rumors about, uh, you know, kind of strange practices sexually. None of these things were true, except the atheism thing, sort of, because they just worshipped one God. And we have our own false accusations at times. Again, hopefully they're not true of us. Accusations that we hate the gay community, not true, right? That, that the pastor wants your money, sort of true. No, no. <laughs> not, not true. Uh, that we don't believe in science, these kinds of false rumors that uh, go around. But Peter says, says, live such good lives in the midst of these falsehoods that you'll prove them wrong. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And that idea of God visiting us, uh, that doesn't refer to the second coming, uh, but rather to God bringing blessing or judgment in a particular situation. 
And I think the context here is blessing. That when God visits, when God shows up, the pagans will glorify, they'll worship him. The, the people worshiping other gods will become Christians by the way the Christian community lives and serves. Galatians 5.13 says, serve one another humbly through love. And that's what happened. Christians served despite false rumors and accusations and, and persecution to the point where the emperor Julian, he hates Christians. Listen to what he says about Christians. He can't help but notice what they did. He says, it's disgraceful when no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Galileans, Christians, support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see that people lack aid from us. So Julian's pointing out, man, Jews and Christians, they don't have to beg because they take care of each other. And not even just the Christian poor, but they take care of our poor. So the ways that Christians valued the poor and the, the sick, the slaves, the way Christians loved and served their communities resulted in exponential, explosive growth. God visited them all indeed. Many new Christians glorifying God. So that's a bit of a history lesson, kind of the history of service. But let's unpack a little more why service is so powerful. And basically, it's because service is subversive. You know what subversive means? To subvert means to come from below, to undermine, to think, you know, think of an army quietly digging underneath the walled cities. Service is one of the best ways to come from below, to get underneath the walls that people put up, not to attack, but to reach with concern and care. There's a pretty cool story in this God Space book. If you're new with us, this is the book we're going through in this series called God Space about having uh, spiritual conversations naturally. Uh, the author, Doug, his organization moves to a new town in Ohio. They move their headquarters, and the paper ran an article on them. And it was a pretty favorable article. And so teams of people in Doug's organization would start serving the community by, uh, they went down to the the, uh, the mall and started filling up the washing car windows, filling up the windshield uh, fluid and stuff like that. And then they started canvassing the businesses downtown and going in. And so they go into the paper and, you know, there's five ladies busily typing in the front office um, and they're not really paying attention. And the group like thanks them. Hey, thank you for the article you ran on us. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. And they keep typing. And Doug says... Um, from there, we want to demonstrate God's love to the local business community in a practical way by offering to clean toilets. And Doug said at that moment in unison, all the ladies had a chiropractic moment. <laughs> they all quit typing, violently jerked their head around and said, what did you say? Doug repeats himself and they listen in disbelief. They don't know what to do. No one's ever offered to clean their toilets. So they ask their editor, they got to call the boss it, you know, and the editor's touched by their kindness and lets them go clean the restrooms. And the next day, Doug's on the front page of the paper, cleaning the toilets, on his knees cleaning. And I don't think that was their intention to get on the front page of the paper uh, again. It's just what happened as they served the local business. Now imagine with me if Doug and his team walked into the office uh, with a little different posture. Imagine if they walk in, they barge in and say, hi, ladies. My name's Doug. We're here to share with you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a Bible. Do you think they would have gotten very far? No. But because they serve, they're, they're actually asked to share why they're doing what they're doing. They're even invited on, on the front page of the newspaper. It's a really cool back door to evangelism, subversive evangelism. It's a kind of conspiracy of kindness. The cliche is a bit cheesy, but it's true. People don't care what you know till they know that you care. People don't care what you know till they know that you care. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. But then later on, Jesus says, don't forget, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Kind of the big idea we're trying to get at today is good deeds create goodwill, which leads to good news. Good deeds create goodwill, which leads to good news. And so it is only subversive if love is really present. Right? This is not manipulation. 
We're going to do more harm than good if we're just serving to get something. It really needs to be no strings attached. Or if there are strings, it's just simply we want people to know that God loves them. And Jesus died for them. And when the opportunity is right, we do need to share. We do need to open our mouths appropriately. Serving is a pathway, a back door, an opening to share. So we serve our way into these natural spiritual conversations. One of my favorite stories about serving, uh, Tim Keller uh, talks about in his book, uh, Every Good Endeavor, uh, about living the gospel in the workplace. And he says a woman showed up to his church, this lady, and she wasn't yet a Christian, but she wanted to check out Redeemer Presbyterian uh, because of this interaction she had with her boss. So she's working for a company in Manhattan, kind of a higher-end company, and not long after she started, she made a huge mistake. Nothing immoral, but just a massive blunder that cost the company a lot of money, and uh, she's pretty much packing her stuff. She knows that she's done. Uh, But her boss goes to the supervisor and takes complete responsibility for what she'd done. As a result, he lost a lot of his reputation and his ability to maneuver uh, within the organization. And she was amazed at what he'd done and went to thank him. She told him that she's often seen supervisors take credit for what she'd accomplished, but she'd never had a supervisor take the blame for something she'd done wrong. And she wanted to see what made him different. And he was very modest. He deflected her questions, didn't want to tell her, didn't want to tell her, didn't want to tell her. But she was insistent. She kind of keeps badgering him. He says, fine, I'll tell you. I'm a Christian, and, you know, it's not real popular in New York, but uh, I'm a Christian, and that means, among other things, that God accepts me because Jesus Christ took the blame for things I've done wrong. He did that on the cross. This is why I have the desire and sometimes the ability to take the blame for others. She stared at him for a moment and said, where do you go to church? And then she shows up. So this man serving his employee with nothing to gain by it, actually a lot to lose from it, Uh, was a powerful testimony to her as to what God's love looks like, what God's love in Jesus is all about. And before she even knows what it is, and I think this is kind of what Paul is getting at in Titus 2.9, teach slaves to be subject to their master and everything, to try and please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they uh, they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. I know we've read a few passages about slavery, and I've talked many times on how we shouldn't equate the the, the horrible race-based system of our country with what's going on here in the Bible. Think more employer-employee relationship. The way we work, the way we talk with coworkers and subordinates and bosses, the way we avoid gossip, and the way we're trusted with money and with our time, this makes our teaching about God our Savior attractive. And people are interested in why you and I, hopefully, are compellingly different from everyone else. So service is subversive. It kind of gets us underneath. Good uh, good works creates goodwill, which leads to good news. And finally, let's look at the habit of service. There are really three kinds of serving if you're taking notes. And first is spontaneous service. Spontaneous service. And this really does start at home uh, with the people you're most familiar with. Can I admit something to you guys? Is that cool? I found that I could be serving all day at church uh, with people who need help and guidance, and and I mean, I'm just killing it, you know? I'm doing awesome here. You know, I'm helping, serving. I'm God's number one servant. And then I get home, and a family member texts me and asks me to order something on Amazon, and I get upset. I get annoyed. Or when I was living with my parents a few years ago, I do ministry all day, come home, and someone asked me real nicely to take out the trash. And I get angry. What's up with that, you know? (laughs) But you know what? Maybe this is about my heart and my motives. If I'm not serving my fiancé or my family, that which is familiar, but I'm serving what's unfamiliar with all my strength, perhaps this reflects that I'm trying to get something through service. That I want people to like me, to esteem me, to say, man, Tyler, he's such a servant. There's a quote that a a true test of a servant is how he responds when he's treated like one. 
A true test of a servant is how I react when I'm treated like one. And I'm not saying to be a doormat or to let someone get away with never doing their responsibilities. That's actually not serving them. That would be enabling. But spontaneous service has to start at home, in the place of familiarity. You want to ask a brave question this week? <laughs> ask your spouse, ask a family member, a boss, how am I doing at serving you? How am I doing? Ron doesn't like that one. <laughs> right, ask Alice that this week, Ron. How am I doing at serving in this family, in this home? So service starts at home. More accurately, it starts inside my heart. But then moving outwards, spontaneous service is particularly powerful and compelling towards those around us. Maybe mowing your neighbor's yard or bringing up their trash can. Doing that chore that's normally someone else's responsibility. Uh, paying for someone's coffee. Doing a little more to help your students understand the material. We should be constantly alert to these spontaneous opportunities that are happening uh, all around us. And last week we talked about noticing. Really hard to do spontaneous service if we're not noticing what's happening around us. And to serve when the time is right. So there's spontaneous service. But the next kind of service is systematic service. Consistent. If you only exercise spontaneously, if you only save money spontaneously, you'll probably be broken and broke, right? But when you get into a system, it's amazing how it all adds up. Habit formation, really. I think it's the same with service. Spontaneous service is important, but the other leg to the stool, if we have a, a four-leg stool, but if we had a three-leg stool, uh, this would be kind of the other leg. Uh, systematic service. And so this would be picking one or two ministries, maybe more if you have the time and bandwidth, and serving on a monthly or weekly basis. Maybe something's on your heart, just something that's stirred in you, or maybe you're like, hey, use me anywhere. I am willing to, uh, to serve. And there are a number of ministries and organizations in your God Space booklet that Frank and Tawny put in there to check out. River Valley Ministries and local nonprofits. Uh, but we are going to have a, uh, we have a little ministry fair here that after the service, I want to encourage you guys to check out some of the uh, ministries that we have, River Valley Ministries, um, some ministries here at the Redwood Campus. Uh, another one that I really have on my heart is Redwood Elementary School. I mean, it's so close to us, about two miles as the crow flies, maybe even less. And there's so many needs there. Most notably right now, I think, is kids who don't know how to read, who need a weekly reading partner. Maybe you have the, the time and ability to, to, to do that. This will drastically impact whether or not they make it to graduation. So maybe if you're not working during the day and something's stirred in your heart for this, would you come talk to Frank or I? In fact, let's actually stop for a second and serve Redwood Elementary by uh, praying for them. So let's, let's pray for that school. Father, uh, we love our city. We love our public schools. And we know you do too. Thank you for the amazing staff at Redwood Elementary, for the ways they improve the life of students, for their care and concern. We pray you'd give the teachers and administrators strength and endurance, passion, peace, joy, and love this next week. Lord, watch over that school, guard them, bless them, Use our church, use us to help however we can. For the credit of your son, amen. amen. Also, a huge need we have, a huge passion, is helping teach and, and help with the kids in the back in our children's ministry. You know what's really interesting is there's a lot of work to be done at the elementary school, like we just prayed for. Uh, lots of work to be done, lots of goodwill to build. And we hope along the way, as the school approves, to, to share the good news, not proselytizing, um, but simply letting people know that we're there because God loves them and because Jesus died for them. But here's where I'm going with this. Every week on Sunday morning, there are dozens and dozens of kids who do not know God and don't know that Jesus died for them, and we get to tell them. Right in the back, right now. All the work that we're working up to at Redwood, we get to do right now in the back as I'm speaking. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool that we get to share with them? Our long-term goal for this community is happening back there right now. And so is that something you could pray about being a part of, doing once a month? It takes countless volunteers to, to make it happen. And 
Uh, just because kids are in a Christian family doesn't mean they're Christians yet. It, it took so many people, many of you, pouring into my life from toddler to teenager before it really sank into my own heart. And so I thank you for, for pouring into my life and would maybe some of you consider pouring into uh, others' lives. Some great ministries that I'd like to highlight. We got Ken with the firewood ministry and helping hands ministry back there. It just helps people that need firewood in the cold winter months and uh, people that uh, need helping hands to show up and do some yard work or whatever. We have Lifeline with Harriet uh, that, you know, as, as we saw with the offering, it's our first of the month where we take a, a love offering for the needy people in our community. And it's so cool getting to see what Lifeline gets to do in the, in the downtown uh, auditorium in the lobby there. So there's a lot of great ministries, and I encourage you after the service to go talk to some of these people. Uh, We have security on standby to see if you go straight to your car, okay? (laughs) No, just kidding. But go check out, see what they're doing, and ask uh, how you can help, how you can pray for them. So we have spontaneous service, systematic service, and the third leg of the stool, I think, is probably special service, special serving, if you're taking notes. This could be a kind of systematic service, like the once a year serve grants pass, uh, or the once-a-year fall family festival that we do at the, our downtown campus. Uh, but I think this is kind of its own category. This is where we all come together to raise the barn, so to speak, uh, to make something happen, to help someone out. Uh, it could be moving somebody, you know, or um, coming together to, to serve our city in a particular way. So spontaneous service, systematic service, and special service. Things to think through in, in the habit Right now, we're going to prepare our hearts for communion. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. And let's close with the God Space story at the beginning of chapter 4. In 2003, there was this standoff in Iraq between an angry mob of Shiites and a heavily armored patrol from the American 101st Airborne Division. The, the Shiites were afraid that the soldiers were going to desecrate their holy shrine. And so hundreds of unarmed civilians... Uh, kind of came around the soldiers, waving their hands, shouting defiantly, even kind of harassing them. And although the patrol's intentions were good, uh, this, this, this incident was getting ready to go out of control. This was going to be a bad thing that was going to end up all over the newspapers. Uh, but thankfully, uh, Colonel Christopher Hughes had some quick thinking. He quickly grabbed the loudspeaker and yelled to the troops. He said, he yelled three commands to them. He said, Take a knee, aim your gun down, and look up and smile. Take a knee, aim your guns to the ground, and look up and smile. And hostility and defiance suddenly melted away, replaced by smiles and friendly pats on the back and some good interaction between the two groups of people. I think when we as Christians, when we as a church are on our knees, we have that posture of service and submission It's disarming. People realize we're not out to fight. We're not out to get them. We're we're there for them. And we're going to have a far better relationship with our non-believing neighbors and friends and family. And isn't that the posture that Jesus took with us? He could have and maybe even should have come in with guns blazing to bring justice to us and wipe us off the map, administer justice for all our crimes against him, Instead, he comes in a servant-like, slave-like posture and position. And even now, he's on one knee. In that posture, his guns are down, his smiling gaze directly on you and I, saying, come, believe in me. Trust me for the forgiveness of your sins. But this posture of Jesus as servant is not permanent. As one day he'll stand and judge. And so if you haven't trusted Jesus, don't delay. Let him serve you today by taking away your sins, giving you new life. And that's what we get to celebrate with communion. So ushers, would you come now? Father, we pray.